we now see how this uh, intensity dependent refractive index is going to affect a uh, communication signal that is propagating through the fiber. So, let us say E is the uh, electric field that represents our signal and that is E naught plus J omega t. Uh, this is the beta, the propagation constant uh, and this propagation constant gets modified considering this nonlinear contribution to the uh, refractive index and this uh, modified refractive index can be represented as N naught plus uh, N 2 i. So, this means that the optical phase which is a coefficient of the um, co coefficient of j in this uh, exponential representation of electric field. So, that is uh, this whole uh, uh, quantity omega naught t minus 2 pi by lambda n naught plus uh, n 2 i uh, and this represents the instantaneous position. Um, so, it means that the phase is not just instantaneous phase is not just omega naught t that also has a dependence. So, this is nothing but omega naught t minus uh, beta z of that form where this propagation constant beta is 2 pi by lambda n naught plus n 2 p divided by a effective because intensity is power by effective area. Now, note that this effective area is uh, not the core area it is the it is not the area of the core, it is the effective area of the mode of the fiber because uh, the entire core does not see the same intensity. So, there is a mode field or there is a spe specific spot uh, or, or uh, transverse profile for the fundamental mode for the fiber. The effective area corresponds to the area of the, uh, so if, if W is the spot size. Uh, mode field diameter is uh, twice uh, w and effective area you can write it as uh, pi times w square. Okay. So, uh, that way you can calculate the intensity and you can represent this uh, beta as beta naught which is the linear part which if you had not considered chi 3 plus uh, 2 pi by lambda n 2 times a effective. So, there is this gamma actually is 2 pi by lambda multiplied by n 2 by a effective. This is represented by this uh, number gamma and this gamma for a standard single mode fiber at 15 50 nanometer. If you take 15 50 nanometer as your lambda and if you substitute the effective area of the fundamental mode for a standard single mode fiber, this gamma turns out to be 2 watt inverse kilometer inverse uh, because uh, gamma should have a unit gamma p should have a unit per meter. So, uh, the corresponding uh, unit of gamma should be watt inverse kilometer inverse. Uh, this number is useful because it gives you an idea of the magnitude of the phase accumulated because of the nonlinear part of refractive index. Uh, so, it means that the intensity changes uh, because the intensity changes as a function of time, the phase of the pulse will also change as a function of time. Now, this is not uh, we are not talking about the linear phase change because of the of, uh, frequency of carrier itself. We are saying that because intensity of the uh, pulse because when you are doing a modulation intensity will keep changing as a function of time. So, there is a phase that changes as a function of time. What is the consequence of that? The phase introduced is omega naught t minus 2 pi by lambda n naught plus n 2 y this is what we have seen here and that is gamma p z. Now, this p is also a function of z. So, I should actually look at p as a function of z. So, the phase introduced due to the self phase modulation is uh, gamma p times uh, dz over a length dz. So, the total phase accumulated over uh, entire length of the fiber if L is the length of the fiber is uh, we call that total nonlinear phase because of self phase modulation and that is equal to integral 0 to L gamma p z uh, dz. So, if uh, we know that the power uh, in the fiber uh, drops as a function of z uh, from p naught to say uh, uh, p naught e power minus alpha z at a location z. So, where alpha is the attenuation coefficient of the fiber. So, uh, 
input let us say the input power is p in then that is p in e power minus alpha z dz. So, if I do this integration I will end up with gamma p in 1 minus e power minus alpha l divided by alpha and this is a constant for a uh, given uh, fiber length and so you call this as effective length of the fiber. So, the power decays and effective length one can understand that uh, you could uh, think of uh, effective length as the equivalent length of the fiber for which you can assume that the power is a constant. So, that the area under this is the same as the area under this region. So, area under this uh, blue line is integral 0 to L uh, p in e power minus alpha z dz. If we can represent this as a rectangle of length uh, L effective and height p in, this area is the same as p in times L effective. right? So, this is a convenient way we, we keep using this uh, multiple times uh, in nonlinear effects because then we do not have to consider the variation of power with uh, uh, length of the fiber. We can just straight, for, straight away say that instead of uh, representing the variation of power with length, we can represent uh, the total physical length as an effective length over which the power remains constant. So, uh, uh, for, for a, a given length of fiber you can calculate uh, the effective length and use that length and if you use that length then it means that you do not have to worry about the distribution of power or decay of power along the length. right? So, that is the idea of effective length of the fiber. So, in the presence of cell phase modulation how does the pulse evolve? So, let us say this is our input pulse. So, I have a modulation uh, which I am drawing right now over this uh, carrier. So, this blue represents your carrier frequency. Uh, it is uh, highly exaggerated and not to scale, uh, but then this just represents the envelope of this uh, pulse. Uh, so, this is my uh, electric field. So, which means that the intensity of corresponding to this would also have its mod E square. right? So, that would the envelope is represented by this green line. Right. So, your phi is omega naught t minus uh, beta naught and then there is this uh, 2 pi by lambda naught n 2 i times z. Uh, instantaneous uh, uh, phase uh, when it is differentiated with respect to time uh, you get instantaneous frequency. So, you have omega is equal to d phi by del phi by del t. Uh, this is omega naught minus 2 pi by lambda n naught z there is no uh, time dependence. So, that term drops off. So, you have only 2 pi by lambda n 2 d i by d t times z. So, it means that the instantaneous frequency is not just omega naught. For example, if I did not consider the nonlinear effect, I would have had omega naught is omega uh, sorry phi is equal to omega naught minus 2 pi by lambda naught n naught z beta z this is what I would have had. So, my instantaneous frequency would have been omega naught it would have been like this at the top graph at every location in time the frequency is the same. But what happens now is that the instantaneous frequency changes and that change is decided by d i by d t. So, for that purpose let us sketch d i by d t and this is how d i by d t looks like. So, as your intensity increases the slope of this with time will also increase. Uh, at this location at t equal to 0, the intensity has become maximum. So, at that point the slope has become 0. So, at somewhere in uh, between you have uh, a maximum for d i by d t. Now, as your intensity falls, uh, the slope starts uh, decreasing because this is a reduction in intensity, reaches a negative maximum and it gets back to 0. So, this is how d i by d t is behaving. Now, how is the instantaneous frequency behaving? Instantaneous frequency is omega naught minus some constant times d i by d t, which means at the center of the pulse where d i by d t is 0, the omega is equal to omega naught. So, this corresponds to omega naught. On the right side where your d i by d t is negative, so this d i by d t is negative, which means that your omega effectively increases. That is why you have a larger frequency. On the left side of the pulse for t less than 0, your omega di by dt is positive, which means my instantaneous frequency is omega minus omega naught minus a positive quantity. So, your instantaneous frequency is reduced, which is why the pulse looks the, the carrier looks uh, like this with a reduced frequency. 
This results in what is called as chirping of the pulses. The consequence of nonlinear refractive index is actually you know increasing the spectral content of the pulse. You started with only omega naught as the spectral content of the pulse but uh, as a carrier frequency but now you are seeing that the carrier frequency is um, having a component omega naught uh, minus up to a large well. So, what is the largest carrier frequency that gets added? So, you can say that is a maximum value of uh, uh, that is a maximum value of 2 pi by lambda naught uh, uh, that is related to the maximum value of di by dt. So, depending on whether this pulse is sharp, uh, shallow or whether this pulse is sharp or whether the pulse is even more shallow, your di by dt magnitude the largest value keeps changing and that decides the largest frequency that is added in the system. Now, compare with this dispersion. In dispersion what happened? You had all the frequencies already present in the pulse. It is just that as it propagates through the fiber, the different frequencies that were already present in the pulse were getting uh, delayed in time. Here what happens is you did not have those frequencies to start with. There was only one frequency. You added frequencies. Self phase modulation resulted in the addition of uh, carrier frequencies and they got arranged in space uh, because the di by dt was different at different instants of time right. So, this also creates a chirp, but this chirp is not because of the delay in propagation, this chirp is because of the generation process itself right. So, these two chirping of the pulses the fundamental mechanism is different between the case of a dispersion and that of uh, cell phase modulation. So, in order to reiterate the difference between uh, what happens to the pulse because of dispersion and nonlinearity, let us consider a pulse whose uh, width is uh, tau. As a result of dispersion, all what happens is in the time domain, the pulse broadens and the broadening is quantified by uh, d times, uh, this is the dispersion parameter times the length times the uh, spectral spread of the source delta lambda of the source. If the source had a spectral spread which means that there was a spread in the carrier frequency already present in the system and because of that spread the different frequencies were walking away. Now, as a result of cell phase modulation what happens is does not matter whether the source had a spread or not. In the time domain uh, there is absolutely no change. The pulse remains intact after undergoing cell phase modulation right. Um, now, if I take the Fourier transform of this pulse, I have a certain spectral spread. Uh, in this frequency domain, what happens is uh, after dispersion, the pulse is chirped, the different frequency components, the different lambda components, the different carrier components, they get distributed in time because different frequency components took different times to propagate through different lengths of the fiber. But the content did not change. You did not add any new frequencies, you did not remove any frequencies. Whereas, as a result of uh, cell phase modulation, what happens is that we just saw in the previous slide that depending on what this di, what this di by dt is, um, you added frequencies. And what is the largest uh, spread in the pulse in the frequency domain? Uh, it is di by dt maximum value times 2 pi by lambda naught n 2 and there is a 2 because on one side it increased on the other side it decreased. So, this is the total uh, increase in the spectral content of the pulse because of cell phase modulation and of course, it gets uh, multiplied with length which means that it is a cumulative process. So, this is how SPM affects a communication system. So, I am considering two pulses one is of uh, width 10 picosecond the other one is of width uh, 25 picoseconds. So, the one with 10 picosecond is here and this one is of width 25 picoseconds. Uh, we are looking at the spectral broadening. Uh, the spectral broadening we know is uh, a function of di by dt. So, if you take di by dt for a 10 picosecond pulse, the maximum value of di by dt is going to be larger because the pulse is smaller. So, there is a sharper increase uh, rate of change with respect to time. So, the spectral broadening is larger for a shorter pulse, it is smaller for a uh, slightly longer pulse. The point is there is always a spectral broadening and the magnitude of that spectral broadening is depending on the 
intensity of the uh, the rate of change of intensity with time right and it means also means that uh, as you go to faster bit rates for the same average power as you go to faster bit rates the pulse will start becoming shorter and shorter and it means that the di by dt becomes larger uh, in magnitude and when you have a larger magnitude of di by dt the pulse broadening becomes larger so the bottom line is that spm becomes in an increasing problem as you go to faster bit rate communication systems what does it do to phase modulated data spectral broadening was a function of di by dt but the instantaneous phase is a function of power so there is a nonlinear phase added in the uh, constellation and that nonlinear phase uh, results in a phase rotation and the phase rotation if you see will be larger for the outer constellation points why outer constellation points the the phase rotated is larger simply because the power in the outer constellation points is large and because the power is large the nonlinear phase is gamma p into z when the power is large correspondingly the phase uh, rotation becomes larger right so it skews the constellation in case of a phase modulated data once this is skewed then it becomes very hard to recover the data right uh, the next question is of course is spm useful in any context uh, can we ever use spm so uh, in a negative dispersion case you know that the uh, this standard single mode four fiber has an anomalous dispersion so as a function of time if you look at the reddish components are uh, slower bluish components are faster whereas in spm uh, we saw that the in the previous picture we saw that the right side of the pulse had higher frequency so it's as if the bluish components were traveling slower and the reddish components were traveling faster so the question is can we have both these effects simultaneously happening in the fiber so that if the dispersion is pulling the uh, reddish components slower the nonlinearity will keep pushing the reddish components faster if you can kind of find some kind of balance between these two effects you can avoid dispersion and nonlinearity simultaneously so that gives rise to uh, what is called as a soliton a soliton is a, a pulse which is uh, tailored or designed in such a way that the di by dt of that pulse is such that the phase introduced by the dispersion exactly compensates for the phase introduced by the uh, nonlinearity now that would require a lot of uh, tailoring of the uh, system and that's practically not very feasible because as the pulse propagates through the fiber the intensity falls the power falls so the di by dt you will not be able to actually maintain so uh, there was a lot of uh, noise in the 80s and 90s about uh, making a soliton communication system but that did not work out uh, simply because it was too complicated to get this accurate uh, design uh, done but having said that the solitons have uh, found uh, or this concept has found very useful application in shortening of the pulses so if there is a um, uh, you know dispersive uh, you can use this dispersive delay and the nonlinear uh, chirp for compensation to get very 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 short pulses and that idea got nobel prize two years uh, ago donna strickland got the and, and uh, workers co-workers got uh, uh, nobel prize for doing uh, femtosecond lasers based on this idea a couple of years ago